Hey Siri. Mm -hmm. What are the most used languages on the internet? Okay, I found this on the web for most used languages. Check it out. Does your phone speak your native language? If that is English, German or Russian, the answer is probably yes. But what if you speak a less common language? Or even an endangered one? And could linguistic exclusion from the tech world pose an existential threat? The more people spend time with technology on their smartphones, on the internet, the more important it is for this technology to adopt, you know, their language, because otherwise it will just start dying out. This is Dmitry Belevtsov, co-founder of Respeacher, a Ukraine-based speech AI company. And our main product has been uh, this really high fidelity, realistic speech-to-speech -speech voice conversion system that lets one person or one actor uh, to perform, not just speak, but perform and act in the voice of uh, another person. Traditionally, Respeacher has worked with large Hollywood companies, helping bring to life the iconic voice of Darth Vader. I am not your failure, Obi-Wan. Or recreating the voice of French singer Edith Piaf, who passed away in 1963, so she can posthumously narrate her own biopic. In its latest project, though, Respeacher is doing something different. They're trying to help preserve the endangered Korean Tatar language by integrating it into various AI language models, like speech-to-speech -speech or speech recognition softwares that most of us use in our phones on a daily basis. But what is the Korean Tatar language? Well, it sounds like this. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Jamilia Blekionova. Korean Tatar is part of the Kipchak Turkic language family a sub-branch of the Turkic languages. Most of its speakers live in Crimea, a peninsula in southern Ukraine which has been illegally annexed by Russia since 2014. But the repression of the language and its people goes way back. It's a highly endangered language by the classification of UNESCO. Since the annexation of uh, Crimean Hanat uh, in 1783 and through all the Soviet times, the language was partially managed by the Russian Empire, USSR, in the 18th century, I think, uh, when there were battles and Russian Empire took libraries of Crimean Hanat in Bakhtisarai. They were burning for a few days, so it was a great collection of books, both from Middle East, Persia, by local masters, poets, and so on. So that was one of the first points for the modern day problems that we face when we try to find historical and literature e events through like different sources. The situation only worsened under the Soviet Union. In 1944, Joseph Stalin's regime forcefully deported Crimean Tatars out of Crimea and mostly into Uzbekistan under the pretext that Crimean Tatars collaborated with Nazi Germany. During those times, people couldn't use Crimean Tatar language as free, though because of the activists and people who tried their best, they tried to put it on the radio, they tried to write uh, poetry in Crimean Tatar, they wrote mainly novels around the deportation itself, and even mentioning deportation, it was restricted, so they needed to print it in secret and give it to one another rather than print it publicly. It is hard to estimate the exact number of Crimean Tatar speakers today, as a lot of them have been displaced. And the last time Crimea had a demographic census was in 2001. Many Crimean Tatars today live in mainland Ukraine. There are also some in the Balkans and Central Asia. During the demographic census, there were around 200,000 Crimean Tatars living in Crimea but not all of them were necessarily speaking the language. I am the first generation of Crimean Tatars who was born in Crimea in the modern days after uh, forced uh, deportation in 1944 by Soviets. Our grandparents are speaking Crimean Tatar language, but our parents do not speak it on a daily basis. And that used to be in the Ukrainian families as well, that their grandparents used to speak Ukrainian in the families. But their parents during Soviet times stopped using Ukrainian language and were crucified. That's why our generation, like before full-scale war, had hard time speaking our own languages. And since full-scale war started for both of our nations, Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars, it was 
the time to understand who we actually are, why we should save our languages, our cultures. As Ukrainians, we can relate a lot to, um, you know, having a language that's historically been, you know, not very widespread and like dominated by another language, given that there's lots of Crimea Tatars in Ukraine and in Kiev, we had an idea of uh, starting from collecting a data set of audio recordings of native speakers. In case of AI, we have these algorithms. They look at data and depending on what you ask them, they learn patterns in data to achieve the task at hand. In our case, the task is to look at audio and extract phonetic content from it and regenerate it with the voice of a different person. In order to train that AI, you need to expose it to at least the voice of the target person that you need to imitate so that the network learns what they sound like, what their timbre is, what their accent is, what are the typical patterns and you know how they tend to use sounds like you know some people have lisp and if you want to reproduce the voice of that person you need to learn that in many words if there's an s at the end of the word it usually sounds different from most other people for example but if the ai is to differentiate between a lisp and linguistic pronunciation it needs to be fed information from many different speakers and recording at least a thousand hours from at least a thousand different speakers is what the project is currently doing. Once we're there, an obvious choice to do is to train a Crimean Tatar voice conversion model that we can uh, use to do projects in Crimean Tatar language. We also plan to open source uh, this data set so that other people can start experimenting with it and building uh, their applications. And though the project is at its very beginning, we know the similar initiatives have worked in the past. Ten years ago, for example, the popular phone operating systems didn't have very good Ukrainian localization. I guess software in general didn't. That prevents people from using the language because they kind of get exposed to new, more popular languages. When people started collecting Ukrainian data sets, putting it out there to the wild so that researchers can start working with it, uh, just the activity in this community it kind of led to um, to better localization in general, so that the corporations who you know write the Android software and stuff, they, they notice language more, they, they spend some more resource in adopting it as well in their softwares. Even if accessible freely online, this kind of technology would still not be available to all. This platform is based in the free part of Ukraine, but most of Crimean Tatars who speak freely Crimean Tatar language are in Crimea itself. If people even know about activities like that, they would rather feel scared to share any data or materials because this could be found out by the forces that work in Crimea right now, which is uh, also a part uh, of what we face in our NGO, that people are just scared to share a lot of information to make that progress. Outside occupied Crimea, Respeacher could help preserve the Crimean Tatar language. But there are still many complex challenges that Crimean Tatar and other threatened languages are facing right now. When we talk about Ukrainian um, indigenous people, it's also Karaits and Krimchaks. And unfortunately, if uh, Crimean Tatars, it's uh, like a few hundred thousand of people globally. When we talk about Karits and Krimchaks, it's just a few hundred of people. And most of them, to this point, almost uh, do not use their language. We can hardly find their literature. We can hardly find their representatives, even though we're in Ukraine right now. The languages go extinct. People go extinct. Uh, we should support them, we should talk more about the differences between different cultures, we should talk how we can preserve them, we should spread more information and be active about that. And during war times it is really important as well because war raises nationalities, war raising the culture, war erasing the language.